Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, where your hosts go deep undercover into the world of spy movies to decipher which films make the knock list. But remember, this information is strictly for your ears only. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. Sorry, mate, have you got something stuck in your throat there? No, I just have a special <laughs> set of skills. <laughs> very, very special. Um, Not that special, really. <laughs> Well, I think that leads us into what we're doing this week, Cam, and uh, tell us all about it. Johnny English. (laughs) (laughs) No, we're here this week to take on Taken, the 2008 Liam Neeson smash hit. Can you imagine Rowan Atkinson (laughs) in this film? (laughs) I would pay to watch that. Yeah, uh, I think it probably would take away some of the gravity of the the human trafficking situation. (laughs) Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about that aspect of this movie because, um, well, I have a weird relationship with the movie Taken, so we'll delve into that in a few minutes, I guess. I thought you were about to say you had a weird relationship with human trafficking. I'm like, how, how did you get to Vancouver, Cam? Are you okay? I can't talk about it, Scott. <laughs> okay, well, um, right, well, first up is the letterbox.com synopsis. Uh, brace yourselves, it's a long one. Taken. They took his daughter. He'll take their lives. While vacationing with a friend in Paris, an American girl is kidnapped by a gang of human traffickers intent on selling her into forced prostitution. Working against the clock, her ex-spy father must pull out all the stops to save her. But with his best years possibly behind him, the job may be... <laughs> <laughs> Liam Neeson read that. He's like, what the hell? <laughs> I'm 50. Why would you say that? (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I'll I'll finish the sentence, people. But with his best years possibly behind him, the job may be more than he can handle. Okay. I mean, that's fair enough. That sums it up (laughs) nicely enough. It's a very simple 90-minute movie. I think it should be pretty easy to sum up in like three sentences. Hey, old man Neeson, we need you to just uh, just, uh, roll around. We do some quick cuts around you for 90 minutes. Sure. I do love the, his best days are behind him. (laughs) That's that's just beautiful. (laughs) Poor guy. If that was on like the DVD covers and stuff, like the film posters. (laughs) Kids, this is my new film. Oh. That's the tagline. It's just like a photo of Liam Neeson. It says, his best years are behind him. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. 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 Um... I didn't see this film in theaters, but I did see it on home video, I think, not long afterwards when it came out on DVD, because it had a, a lot of hype behind it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I I don't know why I didn't go see it at the cinema, because I was at least 21 at the time, so you know, perfect age to be seeing schlocky action blockbusters. Um, but, you know, I, I remember enjoying it. I remember going, oh, that was pleasant, and moving on to... Anything else? So it didn't have um, for you that sort of um, effect that it seemed to have on the world where everyone went kind of taken crazy. Um, No, I wasn't calling people up with gruff voices and threatening them over the phone uh, or anything like that. I mean, I was doing that before. So to be fair, it's not not a change for me. Uh, Although no no one could ever find my voice threatening, I'm pretty sure. (laughs) Hello, my name is Scott. (laughs) And the local pizza place was like... Oh, it's Scott again. He must be bored. <laughs> That's a double pepperoni for Scott. Yeah. Um, no, I, I suppose I just kind of watched it and I thought, yeah, this is this is fine. They're a good little action film. But I I don't remember much about it apart from that phone call scene, which we've already spoken about, really. That, that seems to be the meme that came out of this film. I think maybe the meme was stronger than the film a little bit. Oh, yeah. But uh, yeah, that that's really all I recall. Okay, yeah, for me... It's interesting in that, I don't know if you're really aware of this, but, like, Taken opened in North America, like, a long time after it opened throughout Europe. Uh, It opened in something like, I think, February of 2008 in, in, in France, and moved around into South Korea and a few other territories, and it opened up throughout Europe over the course of 2008. We didn't get it till February 2009, or it might have been the very tail end of January 2009. 
So it was almost a year separation between when it opened, you know, in France to when it actually came to North America. So we were kind of aware of it because there was a lot of talk about this emerging hit that was slowly going to be making its way here. So Taken had at least a little bit of a reputation by the time it showed up as being this international hit. I mean, why? Why was it such a prolonged release? You've got some big stars behind it, I guess, with Neeson and, and Femke Jansen. I don't know. Um, it was, you know, a European production. Maybe they thought it could just be a straight to video here in North America. Like, I really don't know what the thinking was. Um, there's a little bit of stuff I'll talk about in the um, behind the scenes, but I don't know if they knew what they had or also that a studio in North America could really latch on to something to market to an audience that would get them excited. See, that seems strange. This film seems like it's designed to be a, an American blockbuster popcorn film. Yeah. I like, It doesn't seem like an art house European film, you know, Studio Canal or whatever it is. Like it, It's nothing to do with that. This feels like it... It should be up next to Jason Bourne, not in terms of quality, not in terms of quality. Sure, sure. I mean, it, it would have made sense coming out after the Bourne movies had started. This would have fallen um, after, you know, the Bourne ultimatum. It seems like that perfect time period to be dropping those movies. But yeah, it was just like a it took a long time to come around. So when it did, I remember listening to, I think it was the Slash film cast. One of the hosts had seen it before it was opening in theaters here and was talking about how much he liked it. So I was very much aware that this was something I should check out, and the marketing campaign was very effective. I mean, they really honed in on that Nissan monologue you talked about, all the stuff on the phone call. They played that up big time. So it was a movie you had to see, and there was a huge novelty factor of Liam Neeson in an action movie, which in retrospect, you're like, why? He was facing off against Batman like three years ago. It's not that big a deal, really, but... Um, nonetheless, it did have a novelty factor, and I remember going, and I kind of had the same response to you, where I... Went, yeah, that was a fun enough, um, you know, action movie. It was 90 minutes, lean and mean. Um, Liam Neeson's fun in it. But I found kind of the ickiness of the human trafficking stuff kind of overwhelmed it in some ways for me. Like my memories of the movie were obviously the monologue, but then a lot of unpleasantness where it's like, oh boy, it's hard for me to get sucked into like uh, escapist action movie storytelling when I keep being dragged into very, very grim material. Um, so I, I've always kind of had a weird relationship with my with that movie and with my memories where I'm like, that movie's not fun. Like, I don't recall fun in this movie. I recall finding it disturbing. Uh, so I was interested to revisit it. No, you know, talk about whether I changed my mind on the second go around. But yeah, that was kind of my take the first time. See, I, I remember the whole human trafficking part for my first time watching it and you know being quite young i guess at 21 just being like oh man they're tackling some hard hitting subjects here and and you know being thinking this is quite deep but i suppose we'll get into it more in a bit they don't really do much with the subject yeah i know that uh the director pierre morel has talked about how they wanted to shine a spotlight on a real problem um that was happening not so much with kidnapping tourists that was a bit of a flight of fancy on the part of the filmmakers but more the human trafficking situation um and i guess it comes down to this movie definitely has one foot in the exploitation film world where it, it is pretty icky and it just i guess depends on if you're able to separate those two things and find excitement in the action or if you're just kind of repulsed by a lot of what you're seeing I always found myself not like there's worse examples. Like I would say the recent Rambo last blood was one where it was like, Oh, Oh, this is disgusting. Like this movie just feels kind of like sick at its core. Um, I don't feel that way about taken. It was more just like, it's hard to get cut up in all the rah, rah of watching Liam Neeson kick ass when I keep being reminded of very grim things. And I also want to note too, that um, I don't know if you knew about this, but the North American version of taken was edited down to a PG-13 rating. So um, it was, uh, you know, more violent overseas and a lot of the really violent stuff was cut out. And so that was to get the biggest audience possible. So they were very much like, teens, come out and see this movie. Uh, and, uh, t uh, well, I watched the unrated cut for my revisit so I can talk about the comparisons between the two. But I remember the first time being like, boy, it's a lot of no impact violence and uh, unpleasantness. See, I don't know which version I watch now. I guess we'll find out when we talk about it in a minute. 
The other question I have for you, kind of brushing on the human trafficking side of things, when did Hostel come out? Hostel's like 2005 or something. Okay. Because that, that's probably the only other film I've seen from around that time that has the whole kidnapped tourists in Europe thing going on. Maybe that was a bit of a trope at the time, but I, they seem to sort of connect a little bit for me there. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, but, yeah, I, I suppose it's interesting when you said about Liam Neeson being the action hero and just being in Batman Begins a few years earlier. If this was the one that sort of started that, how did this get started? Well, it all began really with a guy named Luke Besson. Um, Luke Besson runs a company called Europa Corps. They crank out action movies on the regular. Now, Luke Besson, I should note, bit of a problematic figure in recent uh, years. There's definitely been some allegations against him. He has a little bit of a, uh, boy, problematic history to him. But he's someone who, you know, we'll be talking about on the podcast many times in the future because he does have a foot very strongly in the espionage film world. He got his start very much with La Femme Nikita, and he directed that as well as co-wrote that. And over the years, he's done a lot of, I think, fairly interesting movies, even ones I don't necessarily think are that good. But he did, like, The Fifth Element. Um, he did Valerian. Like, movies that they are somewhat ambitious, uh, even when they're not necessarily <laughs> delivering what you would hope for. Like, they always feel a little left of center in terms of what they're doing. So I can always kind of appreciate his sensibilities with what he did with his directorial efforts. But on the side, this guy writes and produces endless like action movies. He's done the Transporter series. He did Anna from a couple years ago. He just has so many of these kind of thrown together, lower budget action movies that some of them cross over to North America audiences and have become, you know, recognizable movies. Other ones just more circulate around Europe. But nonetheless, he's been very successful. So he came up with the idea of Taken with a uh, writer, uh, Robert Mark Kamen. Robert Mark Kamen wrote The Fifth Element with Luke Besson. He also worked on the first couple Transporter films. Most notably, though, Robert Mark Kamen wrote the original Karate Kid, Lethal Weapon 3, and Taps. So he's definitely someone with some name value. He's actually done some hit movies. Yeah, Taps was a uh, kind of a military school drama. Is that is that something you like? Taps? It was a good movie, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good movie. Okay. I'd never heard of it. Okay. Never heard of it. Um, but the two of these guys put together this uh, film concept, and they went to director Pierre Morel. Now, Pierre Morel had directed a Luc Besson movie just the year before called District B-13. Have you heard of District B-13? I think I'm getting confused with District 9. Mm, fair. Or yeah, totally fair. Yeah. I think a lot of people were. It's a parkour action movie, and it's a lot of fun. It was, I think, maybe the first parkour action movie. Uh, they remade it in North America called Brick Mansions with Paul Walker. That version is terrible, but if you can find District B-13, it's a lot of fun. The sequel, not so much, but the first one, pretty awesome. I can't take parkour seriously, and that's mostly because of The Office. <laughs> I think you'd like District B-13. It's really fun, really high energy, like 80 minutes, just races through. I, I mean, do you think I do parkour in my free time? Is that, is that what we do here in London to you? Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So you've accused me of uh, a few things so far on this podcast. One of them is being in prison, and now you're accusing me of being a free runner in my spare time. So I'm keeping track of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you were doing parkour up and down those Royal Albert Hall steps, recreating the Ipcris file. <laughs> well, we, we will be. <laughs> what, what, look out for that cut coming soon. <laughs> so um, Pierre Morel began, uh, began his career as a camera operator, and he worked on the Luc Besson movie, The Messenger, the Joan of Arc film. So that's how they got introduced, and then that relationship continued onwards uh, into Taken. And they knew they needed a leading man to ground this thing. And they found the perfect choice. Jeff Bridges. Uh, sorry. I Wait. Was this like 10 years before they pitched it? And then like because of script problems, it took 10 years to get to Liam Neeson? Because Jeff Bridges in 2008. I don't know, man. Jeff Bridges <laughs> was um, attached to this movie. And then he ultimately dropped out. So this was, you know, in an alternate universe, we could have been talking about Taken starring Jeff Bridges. I, I don't know what I, I hate more, the concept of Johnny English in this film or the dude. 
<laughs> well, you got to think. So 2008, Jeff Bridges was also in Iron Man that same year. So picture that Jeff Bridges in Taken. I just keep seeing R.I.P.D. in my head, which is not far off, and that's not a good that's not a good sign. We aren't quite in the era where Jeff Bridges talks like a cowboy all the time, so he probably wouldn't have been doing that here. Okay, okay. Uh, I, I'm not sure I could picture it, but uh, I'm sure it was a thing at one time. Right. So Liam Neeson somehow came across the script for this film and ran into Luc Besson at a Shanghai Film Festival, uh, and he approached him. And Liam Neeson gave this quote later, talking about his experience of pitching him joining this film. He said he approached Luc Besson and said, Look, I'm sure I'm nowhere near your list of actors for this, but I used to be a boxer. I love doing fight scenes, and I've done quite a few sorcery movies with swords and shit. <laughs> Please think of me for this. It's so strange to think that Liam Neeson had to pitch himself. Well, I'm not saying like his name carried that like super value, but... I mean, he was in Batman Begins as Ra's al Ghul. Like he, the name carries some value. Right? And just to like, please put me in your film, sir, just seems like a very nerdy thing to be doing in your 50s. He's also top billed in Star Wars Episode One, which obviously, you know, people have very polarized opinions on that film uh, over the years, but massive, massive success at the box office. So you think Liam Neeson could uh, get himself attached to a low-budget European action film? <laughs> Or at least, like, get his agent to set up a meeting where he's not begging for it. <laughs> like, tracking him down in Shanghai and be like, Hey, Mr. Bassan, please take this. I, I beg you, put me in your film. Yeah. Like, it just seems really weird that he has to do that. <laughs> Hollywood, man, is, is crazy. It really is. I don't even know that this is Hollywood. <laughs> this is almost him venturing outside of Hollywood begging for jobs. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder he looked so good in that scene with the prostitutes. He, he was doing that himself, but with scripts. <laughs> yeah, trying to find, where do I find the offices to <laughs> talk to them about Taken? <laughs> I need to know, how do I pitch myself for Taken? <laughs> Where's Miramax? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, he trained hard for this movie. He'd always wanted to do this type of movie because he was really into stunt training, um, gun training. He really loved doing that stuff. So he committed hard, trained for months, and according to Pierre Morel, this is the quote I always love. He did 99% of it, all his action. I'm trying to think of a scene where he shouldn't have done it himself. I mean, jumping off the bridge onto the boat was clearly not, not Liam Neeson. <laughs> that, that's the 1%. That's the 1%. We've got it. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. He looks. He looked the part. He wasn't like a Jason Bourne in, in Jason Bourne fit. But, uh, you know, he did look out of shape. Well, I mean, I love that quote, though, because they always like to throw that one around when they're talking about a actor not known for action movies doing these types of movies. They're like, oh, they did 99% of it. And it's like, I feel like in the post born era of more of this quick cut, um, I guess you can call it shaky cam action, it's a lot easier to hide actors who don't uh, necessarily have the physical capabilities of being action stars. At least it didn't look like De Niro and the Irishman. Although that was one unbroken shot of him like beating a guy up on a street corner and it looking very much like a de-aged 70 something year old man can you imagine scorsese being like just just after a day of just trying to get the shot right and just being like okay we're gonna have to do this born style get me four cameras and four angles <laughs> and De Niro's just like just like quick cut quick cut quick cut as he's cutting the, as he's kicking the guy i'm more shocked that like scorsese watched this scene being shot and was like yep that looks good <laughs> Totally buy it. Roll it. Print next. Yeah. Really didn't think of bringing in like a body double and then doing the CG after. They're going to be doing CG anyway. Why not? I feel like people are going to be uh, lamping on that scene for a very long time. I think so. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, though, back to take. And Neeson turned 55 by the time this movie wrapped, just to give you an idea of sort of the age he was at when he made this movie. And um, he said he absolutely loved the experience of making this movie. Like, a lot. This was a top-tier professional experience for him. But he was convinced this movie would go straight to video. He said, like, he made it, had a great time, but really didn't expect it to go anywhere. He thought he made kind of a cheap, low-budget action movie that, you know, he had a blast making, but would wind up in a, you know, blockbuster shelf somewhere. I, I don't know whether that's just one of those random quotes you just give to reporters, though, because if he begged Luc Besson... 
or PM, PM or L at the at some sort of Shanghai screening to take him on for this film. How could he have then been convinced it'd be straight to DVD? Was he that hard up? Had the Batman Begins checks stopped coming in that he just had to be like, please, I'll do anything. Softcore <laughs> porn, I'll be there. <laughs> I don't know. It's very strange. I wonder if... You look at a lot of the movies Liam Neeson's making around that time. You're seeing stuff like Kingdom of Heaven. Obviously, you know, we said Star Wars and Batman. Um, he's doing uh, voices in the uh, Chronicles of Narnia. These are all kind of like big productions, right? Like these are big Hollywood films. I wonder if he felt like this kind of cheap, down and dirty European action movie was just destined to not really go anywhere in North America. But like, did he just want to have a jolly in Paris for a few months or something? Is that all this really was? Is that is that his excuse? I, I wonder if he just really wanted to do a action movie like this and that was not going to happen in North America. Like he just wanted that experience maybe. So, I mean, I I remarked on it just before, but it, but this was definitely the first film that sort of set off that career path trajectory for him. Yeah, it was. Yeah. He hadn't really done an action film like this before. Not even... Because he did like... I keep seeing Dark Man being mentioned recently. Like, he's having some sort of resurgence. And that was kind of an action I love film. I love Dark Man. Yeah, I, I enjoyed it, I think, when I watched it years ago. And that's kind of a superhero action film. I suppose it's not a gun film like this is, though. Um, it's not, very, not very physical. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, okay. Maybe it was. Maybe he just wanted to try that one time and then found out he really liked it. Yeah, I mean, I think he's done a lot of movies with action. A lot. Um, even going back to, like, Rob Roy, he was doing tons of sword fighting in that. Um, I think it was more just the idea of the movie being Liam Neeson, action star. That had never really happened. He'd done a lot of combat in films, but never movies that were pitched purely as, here is Liam Neeson kicking ass. Fair enough. Yeah. So this movie cost $25 million. Domestically, it made $145 million. International, 82 For a worldwide total of $227 million. Cha-ching! Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, as I said, this movie opened in 2008 um, in international territories, and then 2009 domestically. Um Although at this point you're like, what is domestically really for this movie? But North America, it was 2009. Uh, so I'm going to give the 2008 box office because that's the one it's listed under on all the box office ranking sites. So it landed at number 28 for the year of 2008, right between Get Smart and uh, Jumper. Both good films. I don't know that I'd say Jumper is a good film, but it was directed by Doug Lyman, who did The Bourne Identity. So you've got uh, Spy Hard's connections on either end. I quite like Jumper. I thought it was quite a... Unique little little thing. <laughs> well, we'll have to stay tuned for uh, jump hearts. <laughs> <laughs> or, or maybe don't. <laughs> uh, so the top three for this year. Number one was The Dark Knight. Number two, the most popular movie to mention on this podcast, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. And number three, Kung Fu Panda. It's funny that this is the year that Crystal Skull came out because I have <laughs> some comparisons to make to that film later on. Uh, so I, I oh I, yeah, I think you know where I'm going with it. Yeah, I look forward to that. I like how we somehow always find ways to organically weave in references to Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, a movie no one wants to remember. <laughs> it has nothing to do with spies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, not true. Not true. There actually is a spy in it. The Ray Winstone character, Indy's buddy, who switches sides back and forth between uh, Indy and the Russians like five times throughout the movie. Does that mean we have to cover it at some point? I don't know. That's an off-air discussion, I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We'll start like a, a GoFundus. So if it makes a certain amount, we'll do it and give it to charity or something. Send your letters, folks. If you want Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, let us know. Um, <laughs> but speaking of spies, there was uh, several other spy movies that opened this year. Ones that did better than Taken, Quantum of Solace at number 7 and Wanted at number 15. And then lower down the list, at number 55, you had the DiCaprio film, Body of Lies. And at spot number 162, the Don Cheadle film, Traitor. Which I'm looking forward to talking about on the podcast, because I've never seen it before. So this is a good excuse at some point to tackle it. Sure thing. So that sort of sums up Taken in terms of all the behind the scenes. It's notable, though, that Taken, in addition to being a big hit, opened the door to dad action movies. Like, the next several years would see so many aging Hollywood stars 
like front these types of movies and you know kevin costner would do a few we've got i think one, at least one of the kevin costners on our to-do list for future episodes of this podcast there was a whole trend of this that um i don't know that it's still going really but you do obviously have still a lot of liam neeson action movies did um did the expendables come out before this or after it uh, expendables was afterwards 2010 maybe that's a connection a lot of these stars thought, hey, yeah. if, I, if I use a good camera work, I can get around a lot of this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure that at that point, if you are an aging action star, you go, to, you go into a studio and are like, hey, Taken did huge. Let's do this. Uh, studios love that sort of, uh, yeah, that was popular. I can copy that kind of thinking. Yeah, that seems to have been cinema for the last uh, 10, 15 years, unfortunately. Uh, if not longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like we've got the uh, the briefing done. I, I'll i start on what I think now about this film. As I said, I enjoyed it when I saw it in the cinema. It was fine, and I sort of immediately forgot it when I left the cinema. Kind of, I think, how you felt about Born Legacy, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, going back to it now, I have some issues with it. They're in a bubble, and we'll get to those issues. But as a sort of a holistic look at the film, I think it's a tight bit of action cinema uh, with a very loose plot that sort of carries you through what is basically a Liam Neeson vehicle. But it's enjoyable and it's 90 minutes and it's just kind of like, cool. And then again, you're out and you forget about it immediately. So that hasn't really changed. But um, yeah, the action scenes are, are quite cool. It's quite a physical film. It feels like these films are maybe what led into stuff like John Wick. Yeah as well but um yeah i enjoyed it i i I don't think i i I wouldn't say it's um one of my favorite films of all time or anything like that but it was an enjoyable experience watching it both times again yeah i found it really interesting to watch for my second time ever last night because you know when i saw this movie in 2009 i knew it was a hit but i didn't realize the influence it would have and now revisiting it over 10 years later Having seen so many of the movies this movie spawned, as well as, I mean, I've seen the lion's share of um, Liam Neeson action movies, and that's not a reference to Chronicles of Narnia when I say lion's share. Um, Thank you, thank you. I'm here all week, folks. Anyways, um, I've seen all of the Liam Neeson action films for the most part, and it was interesting to go back and sort of see how fresh this movie felt in some ways. Like, the storytelling is not fresh. This is pretty, like, hammered together, well-worn material. Like, there's nothing particularly inventive about the storytelling of Taken. But it is fun to see Liam Neeson cast in this movie, made to look the most dad character ever. Like, I want to talk as we go forward just about how hilariously dad movie this is. Like, it's obviously written by two middle-aged men. They seem very clueless on a lot of things that I think are going to be really funny to talk about. Um, But it has that real square kind of feel to it. And yet that is also its charm. And it is a world where dad is right. All other characters in this movie, except for his little princess who's introduced in home video footage at the start of the movie wearing a tiara. Um, These are the only two good people, really, in an entire world of crap. (laughs) And it's all about how this relationship is all that matters. Like, it's really kind of unintentionally hilarious. But I also think, you know, I say that not as a criticism, because I think that's why the movie is fun to watch. It's because it is so square. It is kind of a conservative dream movie. But... You tie that together with a lot of the hard-hitting action of Liam Neeson just roughing up dudes, and it is fun to watch. I I did enjoy kind of going through this very breezy 90 minutes. I think Pierre Morel just has this thing on rails for 90 minutes. It moves so quickly, the same way he did with District B-13. Um, So it just kind of flies by, and there was stuff I'll comment on. You know, I think as much fun as the hand-to-hand combat is, the car chases are... (laughs) Not exactly green grass level in terms of geography or coherence. Um, And, you know, there's some problematic elements of this film I think we'll have to talk about racially. But uh, it is a pretty fun movie, I found, more more or less. We could definitely nitpick things about this film. And there are some, some holes that we could talk about. But, you know, that whole reference you made to it being like a dad rock type film. 
I, I, compl- I hadn't thought of it that way, but when you said it, it just clicked in my brain. And maybe that's exactly what I dug about it. Yeah. It feels exactly the sort of escapist cinema that the, the single dad would have. You know, the, yeah, he was right. And it, that is how the narrative of this film goes. He warns him and he's right and he proves he's right for the rest of the film. Um, And I think Liam Neeson is great in this film. He's basically the only actor in this film. Yeah. Uh, and... Yeah, to have him as the main, I think, was a good choice. He does carry the, the physicality of the film. You, know, you said he was 55 when it came out, so I guess 54, 53 when it was being shot. I didn't doubt his skills. It wasn't like the De Niro kicking the guy. <laughs> Poor De Niro. <laughs> <laughs> We're kicking De Niro, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, on, a, on the surface level, I think it's a very enjoyable film. Uh, a breezy 90 minutes as you said I think the pacing's really good the action is mostly fine except for some sequences like you mentioned um, and yeah I, I on that sort of level I, I think it's fine Liam Neeson is so invaluable here because he brings a gravitas to this type of movie this kind of ridiculous movie um, that is so necessary to ground it like if you had him uh, you know, swap him out with an actor who has maybe a little more of a known on-screen sense of humor. I think it might fail. Like, if you saw sort of that uh, wink to the audience a little bit of, like, the isn't this ridiculous, it might make the movie collapse. And this is a movie that, in many ways, was on the verge of collapse throughout. Because there's nothing about it outside of, you know, the novelty of Neeson and what he brings to this movie that makes it really special. Like, if you swap this out with a different actor, maybe a lesser-known actor that people don't have a relationship with, I don't think this movie really goes many places. You know, action fans may see it and enjoy it a bit, but I don't think it would have that sort of pop culture penetration. There's something about what Neeson does here where he is going through absurd situations by the end of this movie, like gunning up a boatload full of dudes, and there's never a moment where you don't think Liam Neeson believes he's doing this. (laughs) No, you're, you're very right. Um, I I was just I was just picturing in my head while you were talking. Um, anything else? No, I was picturing how Jeff Bridges would have handled this because he has that sort of comedic background as well. You think of you know as I mentioned, um, the Great Lebowski, things like that. Um, maybe he would have had more trouble with it. Jeff Bridges would have been really interesting because I think you can tell that they wanted someone a little bit off center as to who you would cast as the lead. Because Jeff Bridges is also an odd choice. He's known to be kind of easygoing, laid back, not someone you think of as being this intense former CIA agent out on a vengeance quest. Like, you don't really picture that with Jeff Bridges. So I think it could have been interesting. Very different movie, though, probably. And and maybe it plays into this film's favor, what we were talking about earlier, how this was kind of Liam Neeson's first dad action film. He hadn't really done, like, a physical gun action film before and so seeing him in this role was a surprising choice and you didn't sort of i suppose like you weren't used to him doing it so you had to kind of buy it almost like he he was he's known as quite a well i don't know most of my experiences with Liam Neeson are things like the phantom menace and stuff like that um raz al ghul in batman begins so i've known him always playing sort of somewhat serious characters even though both of those are fantasy characters um, they're both quite serious. And so him being in this did ground the film, definitely. And we'd had the everyman action hero thing for a while. Like, I know Bruce Willis is considered the original with, you know, Die Hard. But I almost don't consider him so much of an everyman anymore because Bruce Willis is such an action-ready actor. Like, I know he wasn't necessarily considered that by the time he got to Die Hard in 88. But... um Going forward, we think of Bruce Willis as an action star. But when you get to the 90s, you get like Nick Cage showing up in action movies or John Travolta, who don't necessarily fit the bill of action stars. But when I look at a lot of their movies, the movie around them is really big. Like The Rock, Con Air, Face Off, Broken Arrow. These are like really big movies with, in many cases, directors that are very much of note, you know, like John Woo or Michael Bay. Um... That's not the case with this one. Like, it's very stripped down. It's not something where they're selling kind of the huge blockbuster world of this movie to an audience or the high concept. It's really just Liam Neeson is out to get the guys who kidnapped his daughter. It feels in some ways like a throwback to things like Death Wish with Charles Bronson in the 70s, but 
without the level of sort of gritty 70s pessimism or character study, it's very much that some sort of sensationalistic action story just kind of framed with Liam Neeson. Maybe this film needs Neeson, then. I think that's probably its biggest success, apart from propelling him into this career that he's had since. If, if we had had one of these other actors that we've mentioned, I think it would have failed. Yeah, I may not have had the 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 surprise to it. Like having Liam Neeson read that monologue through trailers, um, that sold the movie entirely. Like that's what had people on board. I think the poster has the text from that speech on the backdrop. Like they knew what was the hook of this movie. And I don't know like if you have Jeff Bridges read those lines, if it has the same impact. There's something about the uh, gravelly voiced uh, intensity of Liam Neeson that gets it across. Back to what I said earlier, I couldn't get away with it. Yeah. And I mean, were you a fan of any of the other Liam Neeson action movies that came out after this? Or does this one stand out for you even still as kind of the head of the pack? And let's not talk about Taken 2 or 3 because we'll talk about those in the future. But just in terms of the other ones. I'll be honest, you have to name them for me to remember. Right. Like they're very forgettable. Um, Nonstop is probably my favorite one that I've seen. That's the one on the plane. But there was like The Commuter. There was Unknown. Walk Among the Tombstones. Um, there was one recently, and I don't know that... I can't remember the name of it. I think it was called, like, The Marksman or something like that. I haven't seen that one. God, these sound generic. Yeah, they are, right? Yeah. Um, no, I've not, I don't think I've seen any of them, and I don't think I need to. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, I think Nonstop's the only one I would say to watch. It's pretty fun. Um, well, let's pivot over to the story mm-hmm. at hand. I think it's where we can start to maybe... <laughs> Maybe poke a few holes in this film before we we love it too much because it's a great action film but you know every story needs a plot for those of you that are unfamiliar with the idea is basically uh, Liam Neeson's daughter goes on holiday uh, in in France and is abducted by this uh, group of I guess Eastern Europeans who Albanians. sell her into Albanians okay okay yeah. um who sell her into the sex trade and it's about Liam Neeson's journey, his quest to rescue his daughter. That's the idea. But the thing is with this film is it takes 30 minutes yeah. to get her on holiday. And those 30 minutes are pretty rough. I don't know. Like, I okay, I agree with you in terms of being compelling cinema. Yes. But I found them often hilarious. Like, I got a lot of joy out of watching Liam Neeson just shop for the, like, most dorky karaoke machine for his daughter's birthday. Um, okay. all right. <laughs> stop, 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 stop. The karaoke machine was something I needed to talk about, and I'm glad you brought it up. <laughs> all right. The daughter in question is 17 years old. Yeah. Now, before we get to the fact that she's getting a karaoke machine for her 17th birthday, can we talk about the fact that uh, Maggie Grace's character is basically instructed to act like a 13-year-old? <laughs> she swings her arms and runs everywhere. Did you notice that? <laughs> like, every she, scene. She, like, frolics. She's yeah. frolicking. Like, oh, <laughs> it's bizarre. It seems like every scene they were like, run, Maggie, run, run. <laughs> like... <laughs> She runs to the door to meet Liam Neeson, and then she runs away, and it's like, wow, this character runs a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, and that that I found very strange. Um, and then the choice of the karaoke machine itself. You think, okay, how out of touch is Liam Neeson's character, Brian Mills, that he's bought her a karaoke machine? I thought that was the joke. You know, he buys it from the shop, he wraps it, and you're like, oh, silly dad, doesn't understand his kids, that whole... That whole stereotype, you know. But she unwraps the present at her birthday party and she's like, Oh my god, a karaoke machine! Now, I was 17 once. If someone bought me a karaoke machine on my 17th birthday, I would think that would have been the lamest present I could have ever received. Yeah, you know, is, is that the lamest thing you could have had at 17? I don't... Would I have been excited about this? I don't know. Maybe I would have. I don't know. I I do enjoy doing karaoke, so uh, maybe. What, would you prefer that or a horse? Um, I don't really care for horses. I'll take the karaoke machine. <laughs> she seemed pretty excited about the horse too. 
I don't blame her. And that's the thing is, like, they set Liam Neeson up as, like, the most, like, sad sack dad ever. It's like, this is apparently a pretty much flawless man. Like, I'm sure that this guy who was, like, running CIA operations um, in Beirut and things like that uh, probably wasn't the world's greatest guy to live with, but you would never know that from the movie. They're like, look how sad he is. He's made it back for his daughter's birthday every single year she's been alive. He has a sad photo album dedicated to birthdays where it's a single photo on each page for each of the, <laughs> Maggie Grace's birthdays. It's tragic to watch. And he shows up at the party and immediately his ex-wife is just ripping him to shreds while Liam Neeson <laughs> just stands there with a sad look on his face. He gives the karaoke machine and then instantly the stepdad, Xander Berkeley's character, Stuart, gives her a horse to completely make him look like a nothing. It's like, this is the biggest sad sack character you could ever present. <laughs> it, it's definitely quite emasculating at the start. Um, I don't know if that was by choice because like she loves the present. So I don't know. It's like this contrasting thing where she's not making him feel like a bad dad because she loves the karaoke machine. But obviously Xander Berkeley's character is, which is kind of a weird setup. And so here's my next problem with the, the, uh, Maggie Grace character. Okay. Just fast forward five minutes. She proposes that she goes to have a holiday in France with her friend whose uh, cousins are away and they're going to stay in their house in Paris. Sounds lovely. Eventually, Liam Neeson's character agrees. Um, a couple of scenes with Femke Janssen basically disappears for the rest of the film. And then he finds out that she actually plans to do a tour of Europe. Okay. Uh -huh. Sounds... <laughs> And you mentioned earlier about these writers potentially being out of touch. <laughs> and this is where this is where that comes in for me. Because he confronts her with this like plan and she goes, Yeah, I'm going to go with U two's tour. You <laughs> two <laughs> In two thousand eight, they thought that a seventeen year old girl would want to tour around Europe following U two. That's insane. <laughs> absolute insanity on the part of those writers that they think this is what a 17 year old wants to do in 2008 like have they never heard of uh i don't know like my chemical romance or something like just name a band like that and i go yeah sure makes sense to me you say you too that the 17 year old wants to go watch a group of 50 year olds on stage over and over again and not not also that well, I guess they had a lot of money because those U2 tickets are very expensive. I've seen U2 a few times myself and they were not cheap, but I guess she comes from a lot of money. But uh, nonetheless, this was insane. Absolutely insane. I, I took the liberty of looking up 2008 in the sort of progressive rock chart. So I guess now she's a rock fan. She likes U2, pop rock. We've got like Kings of Leon. Yeah. Bullet for My Valentine. Stuff like that. Plenty of bands they could have picked up on. Even like Coldplay. Kind of 90s into the noughties, perfect timing for them. If you're looking for like a big band, big pop rock band. You 2 I had to stop the film. I, I had to go look all this stuff up and be like, 2008, this is not right. This is not right. And then it turns out you 2 were like just putting out crap albums around this time. So what she was listening to, I don't know. So what U2 album is coming around, out around that point? Because you have um, How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb is like 2004 or something like that. Um, were they even on to the next one yet, or is it still kind of coasting off that album? I'm trying to think of when No Line on the Horizon came out. But, like, these are not albums that, like, young people were excited about. The next album for U2 came out in 2009, which is No Line on the Horizon. Okay, so it would have been the How to Dismantle an Atomic Bomb. So, like, the song that was big off that one was, like, Vertigo. Um, yeah. So, there you go. Like, do you think that a young kid would be super excited about the song Vertigo? I don't know. It's insane. I, I didn't really like it when it came out in 2004 and I was, I don't know, in my late teens, which is her age at this point. So I don't know how she got onto it. But anyway, that, that whole that whole choice just, just seemed very odd. Also odd. So <laughs> Liam Neeson is approached by Maggie Grace's character and Famke Jansen's character about the daughter going on this trip. She's 17 years old. She's going to go alone to Paris with her 19-year-old friend and stay with vaguely um, referenced cousins who we really don't know anything about. Um, 
I don't think Liam Neeson is wrong at all, and I think the movie knows that. This is the ultimate dad is always right movie, because um, this makes absolutely no sense as a parent. Like, the fact that Famke Janssen's character even calls Liam Neeson pathetic for not wanting his daughter to do this is um, it's a real ask. I think most parents would be like, yeah, it's probably not a great idea to send my 17-year-old to Paris. See, I... I, I didn't mind that so much because in Europe, not that I can say I'm part of Europe anymore. Um, thank you, Brexit. Uh, you can travel a lot younger and it's not so much of a, like a, not faux pas, but you know, it's not a completely unknown thing. You do get 17, 16 year olds sometimes traveling. Uh, a lot of countries in Europe, you know, age of adulthood starts around that time. So that kind of makes sense for a European film. And I suppose this film does have roots in a European film. So I can almost forgive that. That could be it, actually, that Luc Besson may think that's normal. But I think for like an American family, that would be pretty strange. Yeah, I, I, but this is what kind of led me to wonder whether this film was designed to have like a 14 year old as the Maggie Grace character. <laughs> yeah. You know, things like the pony, the karaoke machine, that sort of daddy's girl you know, frolicking, running around thing. I, I, and I know, obviously, with the material it goes on to tackle, you definitely couldn't have a 14-year-old character because that's just, that's even ickier than what it already is. But, like, I can't, I can't equate, like, why they chose to do all this stuff with U2 and the karaoke machine. And yet, I, I just don't understand that all of these choices seem really weird. And this is, so this whole 30 minutes at the start are full of these bizarre choices that you're sat there going like, huh? Huh? Yeah. And and then the film kicks in. Um, I think at that point, it then starts to get good. Yeah, I mean, once you have the sequence where they're breaking into her um, apartment there to kidnap her, and Liam Neeson's talking her through that sequence on the phone, that's like the most effective sequence in the whole movie. Um, it's very tense. It's scary. It plays exactly as it should. Liam Neeson, we see him already going into, like, secret agent mode where he's, like, pulling out tech and everything and sitting there. Uh, he's taking himself, uh, you know, off that, like, physical phone, has it on speaker, and he's sitting there looking intensely forward, talking her through this scenario. It's an incredibly effective sequence. And, you know, you think about it, of course, like, Liam Neeson's just sitting, recording that on, you know, basically by himself, right? Like, we see it the way it's portrayed in the movie. It has a lot of impact. But you think about these two actors shooting the stuff in isolation – it cuts together very well. Like, it makes for a very fantastic sequence. Yeah, as I say, as soon as they get to to Paris, really, because you have the scene of the, of the, I don't know, I can't remember the name of the character, but, like, one of the assistants for the kidnappers who meets him at the airport and gets a taxi with them and then, you know, gives the intel that there's two girls ready to be kidnapped in a house. You already know something's up. Now, of course, you're, you know you've walked into this film called Taken. They're going to get taken. It's just a matter of how and when. So there's a tension from that point on. Like, how is it going to go down? And then you see, you know, Maggie Grace's character seeing her friend get abducted from the other side of the apartment. And that's scary. Yeah. And you can you can understand her fear of just being trapped in this foreign land with no power. And then, of course, Liam Neeson's character not being able to do anything himself apart from coach her through it. And he says to her, look, the next step is you're going to get captured. That's pretty shit news. And you're like, oh, crap. But that's when, and as you say, probably the best executed scene in the film. Um, from then on, I don't have any major quarrels with it at all. No, it feels like that, though, as you said, is the high point of the movie. Like, that's the scene that people are going to walk out talking about when it's all over. Yeah, you, I mean, you get the quote that was in every single trailer. But again, I think it's an earned quote. It's probably the best bit of the, of the film. I understand why they highlighted it. Yeah, I think it's just a shame it takes that, those 30 minutes to get the wheels turning. I, I don't know if I agree with you. Like, I agree with you in terms of good storytelling. <laughs> but in terms of my entertainment value last night, I found that half hour very amusing to sit through. <laughs> well, I, I, one more little like side nitpick if we're going to talk about those 30 minutes. So there's, a, there's another character. At one point during the 30 minutes, um, Liam Neeson's character, Brian Mills. Uh, does a security job with his friends who have come to town at a pop star's concert. And this pop star comes back into it later. I, I don't understand why this whole subplot's in the film with the pop star. I don't know what it does, uh -huh. but it's here. Um, now, they've chosen to actually get a pop star 
to play this character. Were you aware of this? No, I wasn't actually. So they've chosen to get a British pop star, Holly Valance. Okay. Um, now she was popular, and this is why I think, again, there's like a, a dated issue with this film. Because Holly Valance was popular. I mean, she used to be, she's from Australia. She used to be in things like Neighbours, which is an Australian soap, for a, for a long time. And then she came over to the UK. Uh, and in about 2002, she had a couple of number one hits, um, Kiss Kiss, Naughty Girl, I think are a couple of them. You know, kind of popular, but she was gone by 2003. So then getting her to come back and do this role in 2008, I don't know whether someone had the hots for the Holly Valance and they just wanted to get her in the film. Uh, I, I don't I don't understand that choice either. I mean, given the writers, I'm just glad it wasn't like Pat Benatar or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that would have made the uh, rescue scene a bit weirder. Yeah. With uh, Pat Benatar snuggling up to Liam Neeson. Or like Tiffany. <laughs> like... <laughs> These guys definitely seem a little behind the times in their musical taste. So the fact Cindy that Lauper. Cindy, Cindy Lauper, Cindy Lauper, yeah, go. yeah. Um, the fact that they went with uh, Holly Valance, uh, I guess that's uh, a little closer to the mark for them. A little. Are you going to go listen to some Holly Valance records after this? I guess I have to now. I wasn't even aware that this was a pop star, so news to me. <laughs> um, I guess that sequence is there just to show that Liam Neeson, though, is very capable in high pressure situations. And apparently this, like, pop star is stalked by, like, dudes with knives quite a bit. Um, it also introduces us to um, his team, these, these guys he, wor he worked with back in the day. So it kind of establishes that factor, but it's pretty thin. It's mostly there for the button at the end where he can um, take his daughter to go meet the pop star. To be, again, the greatest dad who ever lived. Thank you, Daddy. I. Uh I don't know. I think you could probably get rid of like 10 minutes from those opening, the, the opening 30 and that little coda at the end where he, she goes and meets Holly Valance's character at her house. Like, I I don't know what that was for. I, I don't remember the sequels. Maybe she's a pop star in the second one. I honestly don't know. I don't know. My memory of them is very vague. In fact, in this movie, like Liam Neeson meets up with a contact once he's gone overseas to find her. Um, character named Jean-Claude played by Olivier Raburton. Um, and I had absolutely no memory of that character being in this movie. Like, that was something where I said, oh, like, this is news to me. I don't at all remember this whole very prominent subplot of this corrupt, um, you know, guy who works for, um, I guess, is, is it police? Like, what was his job? Oh, he was in, uh, in he, he was internal security. That's what he was. So I guess he works for, like, the government then. Yeah, but I had no memory of this, like, shady dude who's kind of um, casting a blind eye to all this Albanian human smuggling going on. I remember the dinner scene, that sort of tense dinner scene where he, Liam Neeson comes to the house and sits down with his wife and he, the kids are in bed and the, this guy, uh, Jean-Claude, pulls out a gun on Liam Neeson, but Liam Neeson's taking all the bullets because he's smarter than everyone in this film. Uh, yeah, I remember that, but I didn't really necessarily remember the character or anything that he had to do with it. And to be fair, I don't think the film wants you to remember any of the stuff. And and speaking of like additional characters, now we'll probably talk a little bit more about characters in a in a little bit. But like, there's some good actors in here. You know, Leland Orsa is great, and some other stuff I've seen him before. Um, Maggie Grace is is fine, and it's Xander Berkeley again, a good actor. But they're all just kind of there for seconds and then forgotten about. Even, you know, Famke Janssen, our Zendia Honor Top from our first episode, Goldeneye. She's just kind of like mugging at the camera and crying a few times. Famke Janssen might have the worst role in the movie. Because her entire job is to be unlikable. And to be wrong. Just so, like, Liam Neeson can be proven right and at the end she can be the, you know, very, like, appreciative, like, thanks type of character. I mean, maybe they want to write close to the person. Sure, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> From what I've heard, man. Yeah, From I what know. I've heard. I know, um, but it's one of those roles that, again, you can very much tell this is male writers making this movie. Well, maybe, maybe they think their kids would really enjoy karaoke machines too. Maybe, maybe that's what Luke Besson's kids got like every year with new karaoke machines, and and you too see these. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Here's Joshua Tree. You'll love it, Dad. I was born in '98. Just listen. What an album that war is. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it is actually a really good album, to be fair. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, we've spoken about the plot. Obviously, it is resolved at the end. He, he finds his daughter after killing hundreds and hundreds of bad guys, I think. I can't remember what the body count is, but uh, he kills a lot of people. Yeah, and this is where, like, there is a little bit of uh, racial issues with this movie in that it is very much the white guy going overseas to save his daughter from Albanians, and then ultimately an evil sheik on a boat who is purchasing the daughter. Like, it's very much that other type. They refer to these Albanians as immigrants a couple times in the movie, and it's like, well, these immigrants are the ones causing the crime here. Uh, it's a little questionable, and I think even at the time, people were like, mm, Definitely a conservative action movie. It has those sorts of values. Um, I think there's movies of this era that are probably more jarring to watch nowadays. But this one, you know, you kind of got to note it. It is a little strange. I think what this film wants for you to do is not ask any questions whatsoever. I agree. Like if you start saying, oh, well, why would they take it? Or, you know, how has he got the jurisdiction to walk around Paris killing people and then be able to fly out of Paris at the end without being arrested? which i still don't understand you're not supposed to ask these questions it's it's superhero dad saves the day everyone's happy yeah it's, it's it's the american dream man um i have a question for you in terms of the villains and this is something that may not bother you may not bother lots of people it's something that kind of i always struggle a little bit with with movies like this where you have villains but no clear face of who the villain is so I'm kind of the guy who appreciates a good big bad. There's a reason I love Bond movies. You're working your way up the ladder to your Arik Goldfingers or, you know, whatever. Whoever the big villain is. Whereas I find in this movie, they don't really build anyone up as a villain. I'm looking forward to seeing Liam Neeson get, you know, take down at the end. They just keep introducing new faces and then they get taken down. Um, pardon the, you know, use of the word taken over and over again. But um, it, it's sort of something that I find less satisfying. And I, I get it, some people that wouldn't phase them at all, but for me that's something that kind of, I miss having that sort of recognizable character to attach to the evil. Like maybe if they'd used the guy who was the one he talked to on the phone and kept him going a little longer as an antagonist, maybe that would have worked a little more for me. I don't know, where do you come down? I think if you try and think about this film, and you, that's the sort of thing you'll start thinking about, you know, where, what is the villain? What is the bad guy? There isn't one. I don't think you should think about it. Um, so I didn't. I don't care. They're all <laughs> faceless en yeah, they're all faceless enemies that he has to kill to get to his ultimate goal, which is saving his daughter. And if that means I get to see some cool action sequences along the way, great. I would I have liked to have seen a big bad? I mean, one of the things I wrote down in my notes is this reminded me of a film that came afterwards, but that's John Wick. Yeah. You know, there's a you know, some thugs mess with the wrong person. And then it's basically him getting his revenge because they kill his dog and take his car. But at least in John Wick, there's kind of a big bad that's like, oh crap, we've we've you know we've spooked the the, the dragon or whatever it is, you know, we've we've made the wrong move here. And so and then he eventually gets to the big bad at the end of the film. Yeah, I can't remember the resolution to it, but I know there was a big bad, and I think that probably helped John Wick. But I think John Wick would have been fine without it. Sure. I Like, I don't think it's a um, deal breaker for me with Taken. It's just something I find a little less satisfying. Um, it, I guess you can just look at it as he's just climbing this sort of criminal syndicate. He doesn't really know who he's pursuing. All he's looking for is the daughter. He's just kind of gunning through everyone else. So I, it works in that respect. I don't think it's a, this movie is bad because it doesn't have a big villain. Just something that I kind of like in these types of movies where I'm watching Action Hero you know, work his way through this endless series of anonymous goons is that there's some villain that I have some sort of connection with waiting, you know, at the end. Well, let me ask you then, what would you have done differently with this? Would you have created a new character or would you have made like the police officer the big bad guy? Or would you have made, you know, like the good luck guy, the baddie? I would have probably made the good luck character um, someone who we recognize at a certain point and maybe worked him in more to the ending of the movie like maybe even make that voice something that pays off at the end like maybe he's at the boat overseeing you know the sale of maggie grace to this evil chic character something like that yeah 
I mean, that could have been easily achieved. You just need to see like his face during the phone call. Yeah. And then, yeah, have him survive that assault on the uh, brothel, I guess, or whatever it is they were running in Paris. Maybe that's dishonest, though, to the way like the syndicate would work, where the people that would be doing the kidnapping and the scouting up top are not the people who would be working by the time you get to the big sales and everything. So like, maybe it's more honest that way, but... This is a movie that is not particularly realistic, so um, I'm okay if they kind of bend it a little bit, just to suit what I want, damn it. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's what people need to think, need to realize when they're going into it, especially if you're rewatching it for the show, like like we've done, is just sit back and, and just enjoy it for what it is. Do not dig under the surface at all. It will start to fall apart. Um, so I, after that whole 30-minute intro, we have about 60 minutes of... Liam Neeson kicking everyone's butt. And by God, does he do a good job of kicking everyone's butt. But there's a couple of sequences I think were better than others. You didn't seem to be a fan of the driving sequences early, especially like on the construction site, I imagine, was the one you're thinking about. Primarily, yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of like over the shoulder shots, I seem to remember. I quite like his assault on the sort of final boss house. And maybe that, that lead into the boat fight as well. I think that was a very cool sequence. And also when he attacks the hostel, like we mentioned the hostel earlier, that sort of close quarters combat reminded me a lot of the first few Bourne films. You know, with the, the fight in the house in Paris where he stabs a guy with the pen. Uh, maybe not shot as effectively, but they were still quite concise action sequences that looked pretty good. Yeah, I thought the boat sequence was pretty fun the drive uh where he's chasing the boat that's another car sequence it's kind of cut to ribbons in the editing room um pierre morel pretty good at hand-to-hand combat not so great at car um chases but uh the um sequence i thought that was the most effective was where he goes to like the i don't know what it is some sort of the house with the red door i think um where he goes in and he's basically in a kitchen with a group of these guys, they're making coffee, and he's posing as a, um, you know, I guess internal security dude or whatever, who's basically getting money out of them for, uh, you know, protection. And that's a moment where you have a really fantastic fight that comes out of it and a shootout, but you also get Neeson acting. So it's a really great combination of the two things, because if I'm going to watch Liam Neeson in a movie, I mean, he's a guy you want to see act. So uh, this was probably for me the highlight of the action stuff. This is about as close as we get to a spy scene in the film. He He's almost doing a James Bond undercover infiltration into... That, that was what I was referring to as the hostel, the red door, basically. Because yeah. they've got the sort of pimps at the front and then you can go through to the rooms at the top. Um, and that's where you get to see him going undercover and he finds out the guy, the good luck guy, Mr. Good Luck. Uh, I'll call him that from now on. Um and that was, yeah, you're probably right. That was probably the best scene. Although I, I still think the, the fight choreography in the boat was pretty good too. It is, yeah. No, I agree. The boat is fun as well. Um, do you have any issue though with like a lot of these action scenes where like it's like Liam Neeson kicking ass and then he goes and like pulls a curtain and there's like a girl unconscious, like hooked on heroin, handcuffed. And it's like, oh, that drags my mood back down. Like they cut to that a lot. They go to that well throughout this movie and to me that is something i've always struggled with with this movie and a lot of people don't like a lot of people really hold this up as an upper tier action movie of this era for me it's something that always comes back to me like i've never forgotten the scene of him finding the daughter's friend like dead od'd on a bed handcuffed and i'm like i'm not getting that image out of my head i think it um i think it taps into a lot of people's sort of white knight syndrome and stuff like that, you know, wanting him to save the day. And you see these horrific things that these guys are subjecting the girls to, and you want him to kick more ass and save the day, and save his daughter, and he saves another girl on the way too. Um, for me, I think that's just sort of built into the... Because, I mean, if we're going a bit more, like, meta with it all, yes, there's this sort of fear of the other built into this film, and, and this this characterization of if you're not white american you're like the bad guy and and i suppose in that sense seeing the girls on the bed strapped up od needles on the floor again just feeds into that fear of the other and wanting your hero to destroy it and also very much emphasizing 
father as protector because this is every father's worst nightmare and we see Liam Neeson throughout this movie face multiple scenarios where he finds young girls who resemble his daughter and that happens over and over again so it keeps giving you that motivation for him to keep charging forward but oh it has like an ickiness I find tough to shake like it's not the sort of thing I walk out of the theater just going like man Liam Neeson kicks some ass in that one I kind of walk out going like, <laughs> it, It's not a pleasant sight, and you're correct in that sense. No one wants to see that. But I, I don't think I had much of an issue with it. I think it just fed into that whole fueling the fire that is driving his character forward and seeing the atrocities that are being committed by these faceless others, basically. And I, I didn't mind it. I don't think it particularly distracted. I, I still remember the visual that you're talking about. I can see it now, but I did watch the film twice just today and yesterday. Um, but I, to me, I don't think it really took away from it. I think it just sort of it, it gave your um, protagonist his mission or it drove him forward. It also, I think, establishes the movie as being somewhat of an exploitation film where, I mean, I, I've watched tons of exploitation films, you know, of the 70s, 80s. And that's one thing they'll tend to do is, you know, give you something that's very visceral, intensely uncomfortable. It's often sexual violence in um, exploitation films. And then the film is about getting revenge for that. You know, you think of something like Last House on the Left, um, Wes Craven's first film, um, you know, where a, a young woman is raped and killed. And then the parents get revenge on the people that did it. The remake was a little different, but similar kind of setup. Um, and... Uh, it's something that very much exists within cinema. It's just like this movie does that while also playing it more respectable to more of a mainstream audience. Cause you, you know, as I said, like this movie was edited down to like teen grade, basically PG 13 in North America. So it was something that was very much marketed. Whereas I think if it's like a hard R being sold as sort of an exploitation film, I don't know that it makes me kind of raise my eyebrow as much. I was just thinking when we were talking about it just now, there's a parallel here with a film I don't think anyone's ever made that this sort of, you know, connection before. And that is sort of the story of Twin Peaks. We're both Twin Peaks fans. And in the film, Fire Walk With Me, we see the death and destruction of the character of Laura Palmer. And it's a harrowing, harrowing scene. And that will haunt me for a long time. Um, but the film is driving up until that point. The culmination is the death of Laura Palmer. Whereas this film, you've got this sort of horrific background that drives the plot forward, but it's not really the main story. It just it just adds to the stakes and the driving force for Liam Neeson to save his daughter, to stop it from happening to her. And that's why I think for me it doesn't really detract or and doesn't really stick in my mind as much as it does with you. Sure, sure. Yeah, like, I don't know. For me, it's always kind of had that uncomfortable kind of vibe to it, but... It's also not something I hold too much against the movie in terms of what it's trying to do because it wants you to be unsettled by this. Like it's it's successful in doing that. It's giving you what Liam Neeson's worst terror is, what every father's worst fear is and saying, you know, like he has to stop this from happening. So it's completely succeeding on its terms. It's just something that I find tends to cast a little bit of a pall over my ability to look at it as like an escapist action movie, like a lot of people view it as. Yeah, I can see that. I think another another way this film maybe works is for people who are parents. Mm. And I mean, if the target audience is is dads, no dad wants. To, I mean, you think of like parents going crazy, you know, at supermarkets. Yeah, when their child goes missing, they lose their mind. And so I can see a child, a parent sitting in the cinema and just picturing their kid going through the same thing and wanting Liam Neeson to save the day. And I, I, that's quite quite powerful so maybe having that imagery in there of the the girl strapped to the bed is is maybe for them in a way to 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 maybe involve them a little more well it's a very smart hook it sold the movie the movie's a huge hit and was a phenomenon so clearly like what they were doing worked yeah um so i had a couple of like final things to mention um did you have anything cam um i'll mention i guess a couple things um we talked about the pop star I thought it was really strange her name was She-Ra. I was like, She-Ra? Is that a reference to 80s uh, fantasy character? You know, Luke Besson would think that the kids were really into She-Ra in 2008. Uh, 
It, the spelling's oh. different, but it did jump out at me. <laughs> well, we've discovered that they're completely out of touch, so it maybe is just that. Yeah. The other note is, um, we didn't really discuss them, but uh, you had his former team, Leland Orr, Sir John Grease, and David Warshawski. They show up for kind of a bro barbecue scene. They kind of don't do anything. Leland Orser um, does have a scene where he's analyzing audio and contacting Liam Neeson about the situation. But um, I remember when I saw Taken being like, oh man, the next movie, they've got to have these guys, like Liam Neeson leading those guys out on a mission. Boy, would the future disappoint me. What a waste of these three. Oh, I don't remember. Did they not come back? They come back, but they never do anything. Oh, that's a shame. You feel like you'd want to get like the team together. Um, I but I, yeah, we mentioned it earlier when we were talking about the characters. There's such a, you know, there's a there's a list of, you know, character actors in this film, and they all just have little bit parts. Yeah, and you think you think that why why did one of their team not go with them to Paris? They weren't doing anything. I know, like you'd think that they would be like, hey. We'll, we're with you. We're joining you on this one. They, they've driven all the way to California to see him for his... But I, I, well, it wasn't even his birthday. It was his daughter's birthday. So I, I don't know why they came on that day, but they did. And so they're in town. Why don't they not just fly over on you know, that uh, private jet that the stepdad arranged? It might have been a lot easier. Well, you know, I think we've established, though, this movie's all about dad. This is dad saving the day. And these three characters are not established as being dads. That's true. Uh, that is very true. Well, okay, I, I suppose I, I have a couple of final things then for you, Cam. Uh, one's a question, one's more of a comment. We had the guys from Impotable over for our Born Ultimatum episode, and they called Born Ultimatum a dumb, smart movie. Okay. Is this movie a dumb, dumb movie? It's not smart. <laughs> um, nope. It, it's not trying for any sort of lofty ideals like i think born ultimatum has a certain amount of artfulness about it like paul greengrass is looking at elevating the action film i don't think luke Besson and his team here are looking to elevate this material more deliver a solid exercise in this sort of action film and i think they succeed at that but i don't think it's a uh, particularly smart movie i mean let's be honest when we watch liam neeson tracking this criminal conspiracy um, he literally just walks up to the first, like, Albanian pimp on the street he can find. And that pretty much sends him on a collision course to the very end to the with the bad guys. Like, it's very, very, very easy for him to unravel this criminal conspiracy. There's no actual investigation work, really. It, it, it just, this film requires you just go with it. He's going here, therefore that's the right place, therefore he's done the right thing, and he's found his daughter. Um, so no, there's no there's no smart plot, uh, and it is full of dumb action. So I'm I'm sticking with this film as a dumb dumb film. Yeah, yeah, sort of a well-meaning dumb film. But that's fine, and you're right. It, it they've they've delivered a concise, interesting, fun little package. They're not pushing cinematography. They're not pushing action uh, cinema. They're just delivering a fun ninety-minute romp. Although I don't think you would use the word fun. Ah, it's fun in places. Okay, okay, just just not the uh, not the other ones. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, I had one question for you. Mm-hmm. Liam Neeson's character of Brian Mills has a particular set of skills. What's your skill? Well, we can cross off podcasting. Um... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's gone. Yep, yep, yep. Um, boy, uh, <laughs> bad Liam Neeson impressions. Well, you've, you've set yourself up. Go for it. Well, I did right at the intro with my introduction. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Okay. No. Um, uh, why don't I say doing research into movies no one cares about? <laughs> <laughs> taking taking an hour and a half to talk about Condor Man. There you go. Or the Macintosh <laughs> Man. You know, finding obscure <laughs> movies and digging up facts on them. That's my special set of skills. Okay. Uh, that's that's pretty special, Cam. Mm, I know. Uh uh, I, I, I was, you'd think if I asked a question, I would have an answer for myself, but I don't. So what's my, what's my skill? You've known me long enough. What's uh, my skill? Um, boy, um, geez. 
I would say uh, booking guests, like for interviews. I think you know you've lined up the interviews we've had on this show so far. That is your set of skills. Oh, you, you're being nice. This is, that's not the point. You're meant to like rib me. Oh, now, okay. I'm just, now you're just being sweet. Oh <laughs> god, you've ruined it now, Cam. How dare you be a nice guy? Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, I guess. Jeez. Uh, I I think the other one would be uh, being able to like name you two albums. Is that, is that pretty, uh... I have that one as well, so we're both pretty lame in that regard. I mean, I, I think I wouldn't have minded the karaoke machine now. If someone gave me, like, a U2 tour and a karaoke machine for my birthday, okay. I, I'm not sure I want the horse, though. I'm not a big horse guy, despite the fact we plan on launching horse hearts at some point. It's why it hasn't happened yet. We just we haven't, uh, we haven't got the saddle on. We haven't jumped on board yet. Let's keep that metaphor going. Let's really re- grind that one into the ground. <laughs> yeah okay well i think we've arrived at the destination taken is it making the knock list take it away (laughs) take it away um i don't think this is a knock list movie um we've talked about movies we've enjoyed uh men in black for example being an example that really jumps out in my mind as something that's you know committing to its concept delivering it through making a fun movie but is it an all-time great film that belongs on the knock list or one that, um, you know, is very worthy of being on that sort of pantheon? I, I, I feel like Taken kind of belongs in that category. The one thing that gives me pause, and the thing is, I don't think Taken also belongs on because I think the storytelling's pretty... I mean, it's um, rudimentary at best. Um, there's not a lot of good performances outside of Liam Neeson... There's a lot of elements of this movie that don't really work for me, so it doesn't make the list for those reasons as well. But I will say, the one thing that Taken does have in its corner is it did have an influence over um, filmmaking for a certain period of time. We got a lot of movies like this. I would argue almost none of them were good, so I can't really point to the influence being particularly positive, but it did have influence, so it's got that. But... For me, it's a it's a no, but it's not a mean spirited no. It's not a dismissive no. It's just a no. It's I enjoyed this movie. It's taken, but it's not great. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I fall down in the same camp. I I put this film in the bracket of things like Men in Black, uh, The Man from Uncle, stuff like that, where I enjoyed it. And I would actually recommend, if you haven't seen Taken, for some reason, it's been out for 13 years at this point, Taken 1, check it out. Give it a watch. I think it's quite fun in, in its own little way. Um, but do I think it's a great spy film that deserves to be up against, you know, North by Northwest, some films like that? No, 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 way in, no way in hell. But I would recommend people watch it. And that's where I, that's where, it, that's why it sits with you know, Man from Uncle, Men in Black. I'm sure there's some other ones that we've we've covered because we we spoke recently about um, Our Man Flint, and originally you weren't on board with it going into Knockless, and I talked you round, and that's because I sort of pitched it as a historical document, important for that genre of comedy spy films in the sort of Bond and spoofs from the '60s, and you know you, you said that this film does inspire a lot of films that come on from that. But I don't think any of those films are strong enough either. So it's just inspiring bad films. Yeah, like, because when you talked about Our Man Flint, it's like, well, you know, Austin Powers is very iconic. And we haven't delved into the quality of the Austin Powers movies. We'll do that in the future. But you can't say that, like, Flint didn't inspire things that really had major pop culture saturation. Whereas, like, movies that were generated out of the Taken craze... There was ones that were box office hits, but like I don't think any of them that are come to mind for me really became kind of those runaway, you know, word of mouth movies. Like some of them did okay, but like none of them were particularly popular. It doesn't feel like you get sort of the next big movie kind of like this until probably John Wick, which you referenced, um, which takes action in a different direction than what Taken was doing. Yeah, John Wick pushed the envelope a little bit. Like, it, it tried to be something different, um, much like Flint did, in a way. So, yeah, but that, so I think that's why I come down on No, it was an enjoyable film. It's 90 minutes, and I always love it when these films are 90 minutes. I can't stand these two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour sagas. Uh, and if you haven't seen it, check it out. But uh, it's not making the knock list. 
No. And we will talk about per, uh, Pierre Morel's follow-up to this from Paris with Love at some point in the future. So I'll be interested to track where he goes after this movie. I saw from Paris with Love back in the day. My memories of it are very vague. So I'm interested to see how he evolved going from District B13 to Taken to there. As well as the Taken franchise. I've seen all three. My memories of them are <laughs> like um, barely there. Diluted at best. So I'm looking forward to seeing where we see Brian Mills go in Taken 2 and 3. Hopefully they take our breath away. Mm, another pop star that's mm. very relevant in uh, 20, uh, <laughs> or 2009 when this movie is coming out, or 2008. We don't do it here, but on your podcast, Subspace Transmissions, you tend to like play outro music sometimes. Yeah. And I just feel like if we did do it, I would just have like a servant found what I'm looking for playing at the end of this. So. Sure. You know, um, we're not going to do that, obviously, because, you know, DMCA is after everyone. <laughs> but anyway, it looks like it's two no's and therefore Taken is not making the knock list. And as such, the dossier on the film is filed and marked as classified. <laughs> Uh, yeah? Who's this? Well, never mind who I... Well, actually, no, I should probably tell you. My name is Tom Hardy, mate, from Peaky Fucking Blinders, and I have a bone to pick with you, son. Uh, okay. What's up? Well, a few weeks ago, you went to play the Cold Callers comedy promo, but some numpty left it out. Uh... Would you mind explaining what happened, mate? Because Bane and I, we both spoke on that promo. We both advertised Paul and Ryan's show because we feature on it. And, you know, we put a lot of effort into that, into that, mate. So what happened? Tell me. Tell them what I'll do to their legs. <laughs> yeah, well, but, yes, Bane, I will, I will. Bane is itching to bite your fucking legs off, but he can't do that. He wears a mask because he'll just batter them with a baseball bat. Uh, what happened? Tell us what happened. Come on. Well, usually I'm the first one to take the blame for anything, but this is exactly Agent Cam's fault, so uh, I'll throw you over to him. Uh, I just wanted to embrace chaos that week. I just threw everything up in the air and wanted to see where everything landed with that edit. <laughs> who the fuck am I talking to now? Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Agent who? This is uh, Cam the Provocateur talking. <laughs> oh, right. You, you're the Provocateur, that's it. Yeah, You're provoking me to get very angry right now with your law friend, mate. Listen, I don't care whose fault it fucking was. I just want that promo in. Now, Agent Scott, I don't care if we're related, mate. Second cousin, twice removed. I will remove you from life if one of you doesn't put the promo back into your, you know, another episode. The next episode, if possible, mate. Otherwise, Bane, tell him what you're going to do. I have a very particular set of skills. I will find you. And they will kill you. And it will be extremely painful. For who, mate? For who? For you. For me? No, for them. Oh, for right, yeah, yeah. For you, yeah. Yeah, for you, Agent Scott and Cam the Provocateur. Yeah. Make it happen. Uh, oh, oh, see you later. Bye. Bye. Okay, I guess I'll see you guys in the League of Shadows. <laughs> So I've been asked to do some promo for these two lads, Ryan and Paul, for their podcast, Cold Callers Comedy. Quite honestly, I've never listened to it because it sounds like sh**. But what I can tell you is that my show, Artie's Artist Acts, is one of the segments, and that is an absolute peaky blinder you can't miss out on. Whoa, what the hell, Tom? You meant to promote our show, not slag it off. I couldn't care less, mate. Well, you should. You're on the podcast. Yeah, how about a little gratitude? Bane, show them how grateful we are. Your precious podcast, gratefully accepted. Um, we're not giving it to you. Admirable, but a mistake. <laughs> so yeah, listen to my show, Cold Callers Comedy, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon, and all the other podcast platforms. <laughs> the podcast rises. <laughs> Come here. <laughs> Well, Cam, what are we doing next week? Well, Scott, we are tackling 1984's 
Little Drummer Girl, starring Diane Keaton. You and I have had a bit of a relationship with this story. We talked to Nicholas Meyer a while back. He cited this as his favorite John le Carré story. Uh, we still haven't read it, despite the fact I've, um, I think, lied multiple times and said that it's one of my favorite stories of all time. But I have still not read it, although I own about 27 copies at this point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to delve into the world of this story with this 1984 adaptation. I'm very curious to finally get some sort of understanding of what Little Drummer Girl is. Yeah, I... I have no information about it apart from Mr. John Le book that was turned into a film. We have a great guest coming on who has read the book as well as seen the film. So he'll give us a little bit of introspective on the differences between the two. So it'd be great to actually tackle this film and actually get some understanding about the thing we've been talking about for about half a year now. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. I'm still not going to read it. <laughs> But there you have it, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Little Drummer Girl and join us next week. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Taken did not make the knock list, but if you want to read some more about the knock list, you can go to letterbox.com slash spyhards where you can see all the films that made it and the ones that didn't. We are, of course, a proud member of Quite the Thing Media Podcast Network, and you can find out about um, you can find out more about Quite the Thing at Quite the Thing Media dot com it's a great group of podcasts ourselves included check them all out and you can of course follow us discreetly on social media at spy hards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week listeners good luck